with feedback. Good morning. 
Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Easter, April 25th, 2021. Christ is risen indeed. Pastor Christ Terry and John are wrapping up their vacation this weekend, and we are pleased to have Pastor Dave Christensen re leading worship this morning. Pastor Dave is retired, and he and his wife Jane live in Daggett. <clears throat> Excuse me. He most recently served at Gethsemane Lutheran in Wallace and St. Stephen's Lutheran in Stevenson. Thank you for being here this morning, Pastor Dave. A radio broadcast is given in the glory of God and in loving memory of Al Atwood by his loving wife, Claire. Thank you, Claire. And may your memories of Al bring you comfort this day. Our altar flowers are given in the glory of God and in celebration of their 64th wedding anniversary this coming Tuesday by Paul and Mary Jo Rule. Congratulations and happy anniversary, Paul and Mary Jo. We want to extend our sympathy to Ashley Delaney, whose grandfather, Robert Caliguri, died on Tuesday, April 13th at St. Francis Hospital. His funeral service was held at All Saints in Gladstone this past Monday. Please keep the Caliguri family in your prayers. We have three Bethany members celebrating birthdays this week. Happy birthday to Susie Decker, who turns 80 years old on oh, today. And tomorrow, Ken Erickson will turn 82. And on Thursday, Nancy Pearson will be 88 years old. Congratulations and best wishes for the upcoming year, Susie, Ken, and Nancy. A new Monday morning Bible study will begin tomorrow in the Circle Drive Chapel. Join Ralph Peterson at 9 a.m. as he shares a study on Galatians. The chapel will be set up that, so that people can be distanced, and we do ask that everyone please wear a mask. Finally, thank you members and guests who are joining us for in-person worship today. Thank you radio listeners for being with us either on AM 600 or FM 93.5. And thank you viewers who are joining us on Facebook Live or later on our YouTube channel. We appreciate all who are helping out with today's worship service. Our musicians, John and Kim Beck, Kyra Beck, who is running our live stream, and Pastor Dave Christensen, who is leading this morning. My name is Sarah Beck, and I'll be serving as assisting minister. Welcome to worship. Let us begin with our thanksgiving for baptism. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to the thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared by strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us as companions on our journey as we share our life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts, shower us with life. To you be given praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. Yeah. 
that's not fail, yet I will fear no will. For thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. For thou art with me, and thy rod and staff me comfort still. table thou hast richly spread in presence of my foes. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. My head doth dust with oil anoint, and my cup Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. And in God's house forevermore my dwelling place shall be. boundless grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, and the light of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord Lord have mercy for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord Lord holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord Lord have mercy help save comfort and defend us gracious Lord Amen this is the Let us pray. O Lord Christ, good shepherd of the sheep, 
You seek the lost and guide us into your fold. Feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be made whole. Make us one with you, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for this morning is taken from the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of the good deeds done to someone who is sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Here ends the first reading. The psalm for this morning. As you said, the psalm for this morning read responsibly is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along bright pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is taken from the third chapter of 1 John. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from truth, and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is the commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit he has given us. Here ends the second reading. Please stand for the Gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to the 10th chapter of John. 
Jesus is speaking and says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that I do not, be, that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I receive this command from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I was sharing with uh, Ralph that when Pastor Dick Hutton was here, I, used to, I was in this church a lot. And I, when I came in this morning, I just stood and took in the, the magnificent beauty of these stained glass windows. Oh my gosh, they're gorgeous. Let us pray this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of worship together. We have missed it so very much, Lord, and I'm thankful for those gifted by you in the realm of medicine who have been able to hold at bay this terrible plague that has prevented us from gathering, gathering for worship. As we gather now, speak to our minds and to our hearts through your good news. Inspire us to be better than we are. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. How many of you have ever heard the sermon on Good Shepherd Sunday before? <laughs> I must confess that through 45 years of ordained ministry, I, I think I have preached more sermons on John 10 than any other, except possibly for the text on, on Thomas. The challenge to, bring, to preaching this text is to find something new, to find something that perhaps we hadn't thought of before, and to bring that to light, to give you something for, to ponder. So in, in hoping to do that, I ask you this question, and you don't need to answer it except in the privacy of your own thoughts. But as you read that text as I read it, what jumped out at you? What caught your attention? Was it something that perhaps you didn't remember from this good shepherd, these Good Shepherd texts? As I read and reread and reread again our text, suddenly for me, for the first time, verse 16 stood out. I mean, I have read this text so many times, but this time it shined through like no other. My old homiletics professor at the Gettysburg Seminary, Dr. Herman Stempfli, counseled us one day. He said, you know, just when you think you've mastered the text and you're ready to put together a sermon, all of a sudden the text does something that you didn't expect. It brings to mind another thought. He said that is when new insight begins. Well, that, imp that imparted insight struck me like a ton of bricks when I was working on this. Because in, in John, in, first, excuse me, in verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. 
I must bring them also, and I will listen. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus' bold assertion is what struck me. Jesus is saying, essentially, I'm not done yet. I still have more work to be accomplished. Now think about it. Of all of the things that Jesus did in his ministry, of all of the healings that he performed, of all the teachings that he gave, of all of the miracles that were performed, for Jesus to say, I'm not done yet, kind of leaves us a little puzzled. Again, he says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. You know, the pastoral image of Jesus as the good shepherd is one that is tremendously comforting to us. I was hoping to see if you had one, Jesus as the good shepherd in your, your windows here, but uh, you don't. I have a picture at home. I think it's a, a reproduction of St. Gaudens' picture of Jesus holding the sheep with the sheep gathered around his feet. I find great comfort in that because it speaks volume of the love that Jesus has for, for the sheep. A few years ago, Jane and I had the opportunity to travel to New Zealand to visit my brother Bruce and his family. Now, Bruce holds a PhD in geothermic energy. He also is cross-trained in volcanology. So Bruce and I have very little intellectually alike. <laughs> When I sit down and talk with him, he's way up there, and I'm down here somewhere. Basically, he earns his living by crawling down inside the caldera of, of active volcanoes to collect volcanic gas samples from fumaroles. Now, these are active fumaroles. They are actively venting volcanic gas. To do this dangerous work, he has to wear an airtight environmental suit, a suit that is equipped with its own self-contained breathing apparatus. Now, I have a picture of, of Bruce at home that somebody said a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, this picture speaks volumes. I have a picture of Bruce down inside the caldera at, on White Island. You know, you hear about that volcano on White Island erupting from time to time. Well, he's inside the caldera in an environmental suit, kneeling at an active fumarole, taking gas samples. Around him and surrounding him are clouds and clouds of orange hydrogen sulfide gas. That gas is so toxic that if he developed just the tiniest little pinprick in his environmental suit, he would be killed instantly. I'll tell you, as his big brother, I had no amount of anxiety when I talked to him because I never know from one day to the next if I'm going to have a little brother in this world. Well, one evening while, while we were on that trip, I was kind of troubled about that, and I wanted to talk to him away from family and everybody, talk to him about that because Bruce is, Bruce, to say Bruce is not an active uh, believer is probably a very accurate. He's agnostic. Um, he doesn't deny the existence of God, but he has some very serious doubts. Well, we left his house in outside Topo, New Zealand, and we just began to walk. And we became so engrossed in our conversation that we really weren't paying attention to the passage of the scenery around us until all of a sudden he took hold of my arm and said, look, we had gone out into the countryside where the, the rolling volcanic hillsides, which are covered with beautiful green grass, were covered with sheep. Absolutely covered. And then he said, look over there. And we looked off to the left, an old farmhouse, an old gentleman emerged from that farmhouse, 
stepped down the steps and whistled for his dog. He had a very trusty sheepdog. And together, they walked down the lane to the road. But before they got to the road, they turned off to the side, and he opened a big gate into another, they call them paddocks down there, another pasture. And after he opened it, he came back, and he and the dog together walked across the road and opened another gate behind which were all the sheep. Well, we couldn't hear him, but he was talking to his dog. And then all of a sudden he did this. And the dog took off running along the, the right flank of that flock of sheep. And he went all the way up on one of the, almost to the top of one of the hillsides and began running back and forth. And we heard the shepherd shout, Come! And all of a sudden those sheep just stre streamed down the hillside. I mean, you want to talk about an impressive sight. That was impressive. But what was even more impressive was the sheep came down the hillside and they gathered around his feet. There must have been two to three hundred sheep there. You know, and I marveled because not all of them were the white that you normally think of sheep. Some were off-white. Some were almost a yellow-white. Some actually had a reddish tint to their fleece. And there was actually a couple of black sheep there. But they all gathered and they stopped at his feet. Now, we were far enough away, as I said, we couldn't understand what he was saying, but he talked to the sheep. And then he simply turned and walked across the road and walked through the open gate and stopped maybe 20 feet inside the gate. And the sheep followed him. And again, they gathered around his feet. And again, for a few moments, he talked to them. And then he did this. And the sheep just streamed into that new pasture to relish on that fresh new grass that was there. I have to admit, as I, as I saw this taking place before my eyes, I couldn't help but think of the Good Shepherd text. I mean, Jesus says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. It was very obvious that these sheep knew who their shepherd was. They knew who it was that protected them. They knew who it was that loved them, who it was that would not allow anything to befall them. I looked at my brother and I said, Bruce, are you familiar with John 10? And he said, nope. And, you know, dumb me, I should have understood. He wouldn't understand that. But he, uh, I explained to him the, the Good Shepherd text. I said, the Usually the fourth Sunday after Easter is Good Shepherd Sunday, and this text is shared in church. And he said, oh, is that interesting? So that came to mind this past week as I began working on this text. As I read the text, I couldn't help but be astounded again, totally astonished again by what I had seen in New Zealand. And especially by the words that Jesus speaks, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Suddenly, as I was reading that, and suddenly as I thought about that scene in New Zealand, suddenly it dawned on me that in verse 16, where Jesus, Jesus says, I have other sheep, not of this fold. It suddenly dawned on me, Jesus is saying, I'm not done yet. I'm not done with my ministry. I still have other sheep out there who need to hear me. Well, if we say, Jesus says, I'm not done yet, by extension, we can say, God's not done either. This took on a whole new meaning for me. I mean, I've been a parish pastor for, 35, for 45 years, but this triggered a whole new train of thought. It took on greater meaning. This matters, I think, for at least three reasons and perhaps several more. 
But first, God continues today to call people from various walks of life, from various places in society, from various stations according to work. You know, some are some are PhDs in geology, some are lawyers, some are pastors, school teachers, that whole collection. He calls them from every nation, from every single generation. He's uttered those words across generations to today, to this moment. Think about it. If it were not true, if this hadn't, ha if this hadn't taken place, if this were not true, you and I wouldn't be here. You and I wouldn't have the benefit of a church that we grew up in. We would not have a faith in Jesus Christ. Think about that. We would not be giving our lives to the task and to the joy of proclaiming Christ as Lord. Secondly, God is at work in our midst today. How many of you realize that you're a work in progress? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah. We're works in progress. My father used to say that, and he, dad, dad was not uh, a church-going person. He was, a, he was what you call a C&E. &E. He went to church on Christmas, he went to church on Easter, and he gave a, an offering to his, his Baptist church. But dad was not a faithful you know, faithful Christian by the way that we, we call, classify faithful Christians. But he, you know, he, he puzzled me. You know. God is at work. God is at work in all of us. My father was an orthopedic surgeon. Even though dad was not a, a devout Christian, you could see in, God, in, his, in the artistry of his surgery that God's hand was truly guiding his. God is using our lives, yours and mine, to invite others to faith. You know, no matter who we are. No matter where we are. No matter our educational level, no matter, no matter any other thing that the world writes down as being important, God uses everyone for his purposes. God is using your lives today to invite others to faith. You know, as a pastor, when I, when I interview at congregations, when I receive calls to congregations, people always, I always ask people about the shut-ins. Do you go out and visit the shut-ins? Well, back, in, back when I was a young pastor, only the pastor did that. The pastor went out and visited the shut-ins and took communion to them. Uh, now, today, that practice has changed somewhat where Pastors have lay leaders in the congregation who take communion out. But going out and visiting those people, a lot of people said they didn't feel comfortable doing that. And they go, why? Because, well, we don't know what to say. And I said, trust me, if you agree to go out and do it, God will let you know what to say. How many of you do something like that? Do you, are you, okay, good, a couple of you, sure. Yeah, the more we get involved in the church, the more we get involved in the ministry of the church, the more we get involved in this ministry that Jesus has handed to us and take that and put it to work, not only within our community of faith, but outside, the, church, the work of Jesus has continued. Jesus' work continues in and through us. And believe it or not, you know, our words are important. You know, I had a lady at my church in St. Stephen's, uh, Elaine, God bless her, was a very faithful member. She was also from Racine, where I was from. But Elaine, one day, one Sunday morning, after years and years of serving in the church on various committees, on the altar guild, the uh, women of the ELCA, 
she announced that uh, she was going to retire. And I said, retire? She said, yes. She said, I've done this for years. Now it's time for somebody younger to do it. And I said, Elaine, let me check something here with you. So my understanding of Christian service, Christian life in the church, is that we're not retired until God calls us home. And she said, what? <laughs> I said, God's not through with you yet. And she went, oh, shoot. <laughs> but a lot of people feel that way, you know. That's somebody else's task. That's somebody else's responsibility. Problem is, people don't see the impact of the good news when they share it. If they don't share it, they don't see it. So third reason, I would urge you to read through the book of Acts of the Apostles. Read how the church grew. Remember a few weeks back we had that text where the disciples were huddled in, a, in a, 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 some room in the out, outside outlying areas of Jerusalem after Jesus had been crucified, where they hung back in this room. They whispered because they were afraid they might attract attention. They shuddered at every sound out in the street. Was that a sword being drawn from a scabbard? Were the, were the Jewish authorities going to bust in and arrest them? Maybe that was Roman, Roman officers out there. I mean, they sat huddled in that room and terrified. The church burst forth from that room. They went out and taught. They went to various places. Then Paul came on the scene. Saul, who was converted at that appearance, Jesus appeared to him. He was blinded by the brilliance of the light from Damas outside in Damascus. And Jesus appeared to him and said, called, called him Paul and said, you have a work to do also. And Paul went out and founded all the churches that are in our New Testament. All the, all the churches, Corinth and Ephesus and Galatia and Philippians, all, all of those. That work continued because of the great, you know, the very great expansiveness of God's word. That word inspires us to, to go out to do things we wouldn't ordinarily think we can do. We're able to do that because God is there inspiring us to do that. So where does that, where does that leave us? Where do we start? I know a lot of, one church that I served, they, they had a, they lived, they were in a little community of Cicero, Indiana, right on the shore of a feeder reservoir for the city of Indianapolis. And it was a very sleepy little community. And this congregation was kind of very staid, laid back. And the synod president back in those days, there weren't bishops yet, but synod president, uh, Ralph, Ralph Kemsky, wanted to find a young pastor from outside of the synod because the only pastors that wanted to serve there were old past older pastors who wanted to retire. And the only challenge they had was who they would play in tennis. He said, I don't want that. He said, this church, this church needs to grow. So he interviewed me, and I got the call. And I asked them the first Sunday I was there in the pulpit, I said, I've heard various numbers of you say you want to grow. I said, do you want to grow? How many... If you want to grow, raise your hand. They all raised their hand. And I said, how many of you want to help facilitate that growth? Raise your hand. One actually said, what does that entail? I said, that entails using your voice to tell the story, to tell the story of Christ. I said, but more than using your voice, it's living that word. Letting people see the Christ who is living and dwelling and inspiring you. That's what's, that's what's pretty important. That's what our, our second lesson today talks about. You know, the Christ, that we sh the Christ that we witness to needs to be the Christ that people can see working in and through us. So in the congregation, 
I know the churches I served had pretty healthy and active lists. Does Bethany? That's a place to begin. For one reason or another, somebody got turned off. Maybe it was by somebody's comment. Maybe it was, you know, an expression that they perceived as being unkind. And they drew back and withdrew. When I was, when I was in Bark River, I took a class with Dr. Tim Savage on the board and apathetic church member. And that class emphasized the fact that when you go out and talk to these people, you're not to be judgmental. You know, I actually heard a member say one time to a person who came and visited for the first time in a long time, and they walked in, I thought the ceiling was going to fall in on you. That person turned right around, walked out the door, and never came back. You know? That happens. But not to be judgmental. You go out and you talk, you, you talk with people like that. You bump into them all the time in the community. You know, in the, in the, in the workplace, in the marketplace. We, you bump into them. And pretty much you, try, you, you try, try to ignore them and they try to ignore you. But wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be interesting and different if when you saw them, you walked over to them and said, Hi, Bill, or hi, Susan. I've missed you. See what kind of a reaction you get. We also have family members. As I said, I have a younger brother who's an agnostic, but I have a, a, a young brother, too, four years younger than me, who has just turned away from the church completely. And I have talked myself blue in the face to try and encourage them. And you know what the alternative is? Pray for them. Pray, pray, pray for them. Because the power of prayer is unbelievably That can, that can bring changes. So I you know, work with your family members. Extend the invitation. The invitation to, to worship to come and see. Because this gathering here, this is important. This is important for faith building. Not only for young people, young children as they're coming up, coming of age and being confirmed in members of the church, but not only for members who are coming back after a long time, but it's for you and I. Because this moment of worship, this is our identity. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And as such, we are growing in that relationship with Christ and in worship, we reach out to each other we grow in relationship to each other, too. Brothers and sisters in Christ, on this Good Shepherd Sunday, Jesus is not done yet. He's not done, and Jesus will use you. He will use your talents, your skills, your abilities, your experience, your lack of experience, your, you know, your genetics. He'll use, you know, if you're a woman, he has a place for you. If you're a man, he has a place for you. He will use your oath to take his word and make his word known. Let us rejoice in that. Because Jesus is our good shepherd. He knows us. He knows you. And you know him. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for, your, for the resurrection of your son. We thank you for his his love. We thank you for his coming to us. We thank you for him not giving up on us. Help us to understand today on this Good Shepherd Sunday that Jesus isn't done yet. Neither are you. You call us into your family. You call us to your son's table to receive his body and blood, to be strengthened and nurtured as we take Christ within us. Empower us, Lord through your good news, to carry that good news to those who have yet to hear, to those who have perhaps forgotten, and share that good news by sharing the love of Christ that lives and dwells within us. Thank you, Lord, for this time of worship together. 
For we pray this in the name of your only beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Have no fear, little flock. Have no fear, little flock. For the Father has chosen. Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving Shepherd, you know your own and your own know you. Your voice calls us to your loving embrace. Strengthen your church throughout the world that we bear witness to your expansive love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious shepherd, you are generous with the gifts of goodness and mercy. Restore your creation to wholeness so that cities and towns, countryside and wilderness may abound with life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Hope giving shepherd, the nations and peoples are your heritage. Place into the hearts of all leaders and rulers the passion to serve. Crucify any desire to overpower others and give leaders joy in lifting up the lowly. Hear us, O oh God. 
Your mercy is great. Abiding shepherd, your love flows as we reach out to those around us. Move us with your spirit so that we lay down our lives for those in need. Help us love one another in truth and action. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Saving shepherd, you restore us to wholeness. Help our community in our life together and give us vigor as a people of faith. In the midst of challenges and opportunities, fill us anew with your Holy Spirit. We pray especially for Carol Buttrin, Rob Wilson, Kim Anderson, Cindy Rosbecki, Sabrina Amelia and Gabriel Mexicki, Dick Sallow, Amanda Norkley, Cambria Grenfell, Bill Van Effen, Don Johnson, and those we name before you now, either aloud or in this moment of silence. Glenn, Heather Lynn, Bruce. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Eternal Shepherd, you hold us secretly or securely in your loving hands. In the assurance of resurrection, hope, we remember our loved ones who have died in you, especially Jim Pina. Bring us with them to dwell in your house forever. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please take this moment to share the peace safely and comfortably.
please stand as you are able. of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thy thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us, us this day, day our daily, daily bread, bread and, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. The table is prepared. Come to the feast of our Lord.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for this gift, this gift of your body and blood. And we pray that as we gather to eat your bread, your body, and drink the cup, your blood, that we may be strengthened and nourished for continued service. For we pray in your holy and blessed name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Go in peace, share the good news. Alleluia.